Uh, so the word he gave me was mercy triumphs over judgment. I'll try to unpack that in a relatively short time. Uh, you, you might be able to read it. It's Micah 6, 8. It says, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly, right? That's from the Old Testament. And this is mercy triumphs over judgment, which is from James chapter 2, verse 13. So we're going to unpack that a little. Can you just, uh, this is the picture I'm getting. Put your hand over your heart and say, Lord, my heart is good ground, and I receive good seed today. I receive the meal that you want to feed me. And touch your head and say, Lord, my mind is open to be renewed by your word. I want to walk out of here different than I walked in, more like Jesus and less like my carnal nature. Only you can do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't ever forget that one, right? If Paul said he has not arrived, then we should never think that we're going to completely arrive in this, in this life, right? And then 2 Corinthians 3.18 in the NIV version says that we are being transformed into the image of God with ever-increasing glory here in this life. So if you need a mission statement, that's a good place to start. Being transformed. Being transformed. You might say, well, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. But then why does Paul say, you're still on the milk, and I want you to be on the meat I want you to grow up. I want you to mature, right? So we're being transformed. That's our goal is to be an imitation of Christ, to be a reflection, an ambassador of his in the earth. All right? So you mind just cut me a little slack. I'm going to go fast. I want to cover some scriptures. You don't have to take a lot of notes because you could just watch it online afterwards if you want. But I just want you to keep your spirit open to the, to the linkage that I'm going to try to put out here for you. I um, tend to talk too long, I guess you could say, but I have a lot to say. <laughs> James 2.12 says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Can you say that with me? For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. All right, so that, that 13 is a big deal today because there's a lot of people being canceled for making a mistake. That's part of what they call the culture today is the cancel culture. That's not Jesus. Man, if there was a cancel culture, I would have never been allowed in. So I hope all of us realize Ephesians 2 is such a cornerstone when it says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Do you believe that? I hope you do, but don't forget it now that you're a Christian. Don't forget, I once was dead. And then verse 2 says, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. That's a good translation, right? We were working for a boss, and we didn't know it. His name is the devil, and he's a really mean boss because he's a liar. And you don't want to work for somebody who's a liar. You want to work for the truth. Okay, and it looks fun. I mean, obviously, he's a good liar, so he tempts you to, to, to disobey God, and there is pleasure in sin for a season. Biblical phrase, right? Moses stood the test because he was willing to be persecuted with the people of God rather than indulge in the pleasures of sin, right, for a season. So we need the discipline to avoid those temptations. It's not by our might or by our power. It's the spirit of the holy God living in us that gives us the strength to do what we can't do in our own ability. But God, who is rich in mercy, oh, I love this, he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Jesus from the dead. You with me? Does anybody here think you didn't need to get salvation? Okay, so you can't forget that forgiveness was extended to you. And turn around and not extend forgiveness to other people. And it doesn't give them a license to sin against you or for, for them to just run all over you. But... As it said in that prior verse, I'll just go back to it quickly. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. So when you're humbled and you realize that you're going to make a mistake between now and the rest of your life. Anybody want to disagree with that one? Yeah, no, we didn't stop sinning when we became a Christian, but we have access to a kingdom where we can be forgiven and grow and get tools to help us stop sinning. But if I know that between now and, then, and the day I die, I will sin again, then I'm going to hope that the, whoever I sinned against is going to show mercy, not judgment. 
But the formula here says judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. So if I'm living my life constantly being the police officer of the kingdom of God, judging everybody for what they're doing wrong, then when my turn comes to expect to be able to receive some mercy, it's not going to happen. Right? Judge not lest you be judged, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. For with the measure you judge, it will be measured back to you. And who are you to say that there's a speck in your brother's eye when you have telephone pole <laughs> sticking out of your eye. Anyway, that's another day's teaching. This is about what happens when we're not willing to forgive and extend mercy. And I, only, I could give you many examples, but this is one that always stuck out to me. Way back in Genesis 27, it says Esau, what? Hated Jacob. That's not good in a family, is it? Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Maybe there was a little Sicilian blood in there. I don't know, but that, that could be. I, I can only say that because I am half. <laughs> so we're allowed to pick on our own people, right? But when you're, when you're allowing something to just cook in the oven and you're, you're planning, like Absalom did this too because his brother Amnon had raped his sister, and it says he didn't say anything, but the, but the scheme was cooking on the inside. That's like poison in your system. And the more you keep justifying and thinking about it and giving yourself a reason to do it, then eventually you can pull the trigger. And the wording in 42 is really telling. Rebecca is their mother, right, Esau and Jacob's mother. She heard about Esau's plans, and she sent for Jacob and told him, listen, Esau is consoling himself by plotting to kill you. And I, I think if we were all honest, there have been times that we wanted to say something in the moment, and then when we got out here, we said, oh, why didn't I say that? Remember that? You've done that? And then it's like, I should have just put my fingers and my hands around their neck and started choking them. <laughs> no, not as a Christian, you would never say that, I'm sure. But back in the old days. But that scheme to take somebody down through their reputation, through gossip, rumors, however, it's the same idea, right? It's taking vengeance for a wrong. When we all know the Bible says vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But we say, you need a little help on this one, God, because it's taking too long. I could just picture as Esau is going to sleep and he's bothered by something. He's picturing his hands going around his brother's neck and just choking him. And as we see his eyes popping out. And somehow that's consoling him. That's not a good thing. But it happens all the time. And that's what the cancel culture is partly about. There's no mercy. There's no forgiveness. And, and it, it's really not a good long-term plan. Because you will make a mistake. All right, so I said, canceled. Expect no mercy in Pottersville. <laughs> I mean, that movie has got a billion correlations between God's kingdom and the world's kingdom. And it's really powerful to think about one life. What a difference that town if one guy wasn't there. And of course, that's representing God in a person, because Pottersville is what we say all the time. It's a, it's a cold, cruel world. That's Pottersville. Remember, what was his name, Uncle? The uncle that lost the money? Billy, Uncle Billy had a little drinking problem, and he's getting an attitude with Mr. Potter in the bank, and he forgets that the money is in the newspaper, right? And now Mr. Potter gets it. Now, what would a Christian do, I think, would give the money back, right? Like, that's why we know what we're differently, because I think there's a calculation in our brain to say, you know what, if I steal this money from him right now, I might keep it for a while, but something bad's going to happen down the road, right? Now, that's not karma. That's, that's, that's the rules of the Word of God. You don't steal <laughs> right in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> don't steal. And when you disobey the laws, the the protection of God comes away because the blessing comes in obedience. It's not that God wants to punish you. You step outside the protection because you disobeyed him. But you come back into the protection by asking for forgiveness. And look, he said, pick up your cross every day. Like, I'm sorry to keep reminding you of that, but, you know, that means that there's, there's always going to be something he's willing to work on with us. 
So I'm not expecting them to think like we do. And that's a good picture of the culture right now, is this guy saying, who are you? I've got the reins. And Jimmy Stewart's looking at him and saying, hey, can you give me a break? And what ended up happening in that movie, you know how awesome it is, is that it was the town, the people rallied around and kept bringing the money into the bank so that they could make it, right? That's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. We're supposed to rally. We don't look at somebody and say, you're hopeless. You can never change. Because God would never say a person could never change. You would have said that about the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus until Jesus appeared to him. And he says, well, who are you, Lord? I'm the one that you're fighting against. And then he becomes an author of you know, a huge chunk of the Bible, right? So you never know. Here's the deal. Live as if it's possible that that person could change, even if you've seen no change, because God can change anybody. And he expects us to try to do that.